Good evening. You are listening to Watchmen on the Pod. This is Pamela, and with me is Nikki. Good evening. Good evening. Or good morning. <laughs> yeah, wherever you're at, huh? Mm-hmm. Um, this is the continuation of David Pawson's book entitled Remarriage is Adultery Unless. Tonight we are going to be reading chapter 2 and chapter 3. Chapter 2 what Moses said. It may seem strange to consider the Mosaic laws in a different chapter to the Ten Commandments, so associated with his name, but there are clear distinctions between them, and this is one way to draw attention to them. We have already pointed out that God wrote down the ten, and Moses wrote down the six hundred and three others. The former at the top of Mount Sinai, the latter at its foot, and elsewhere on the journey to the promised land of Canaan. We may say that God gave the ten to Moses and the rest through him, though all were directed to the same people. We could say that Moses is primarily concerned with the interpretation and the application of the basic ten principles and particularly the final six, though he does introduce much new material. The main difference lies in the way the laws are expressed. There is a clear trend from the apodectic to the caustic style to give them their technical titles. That is, from the categorical, you shall now not, to the conditional, if you do, then. There is a shift from absolute prohibition to relative regulations, a consideration of circumstances. This involves going into much more detail. A further point to notice is the holistic nature of the law or the Torah equals instruction, as it is called in the Hebrew. It covers the whole of life, food, clothes, marriage, war, etc. Furthermore, there is no division between sacred and secular aspects of life. Ceremonial, civil, and moral laws are integrated into one legal system. That is why to break any of it is to break the whole of it. That's in chapter, I mean, that's Deuteronomy chapter 27 verse 26 the cross reference is matthew chapter 5 verse 19 galatians chapter 3 verse 10 and james chapter 2 verse 10. the western mind wants to classify them and treat them separately whereas the ten were clearly directed to the individual you shall or shall not. The Mosaic laws clearly have a corporate bent. The social life of the people is constantly in mind, as is the community's responsibility to administer punishment for infringement. The objective is clearly to present a holy, healthy, and therefore happy society to a a world failing to achieve it. Various sanctions are to be applied. The one retribution not mentioned is imprisonment. With these preliminary observations in mind, we turn to these passages which have been quoted in connection with the debate on divorce and remarriage. Rather than take space to reproduce these in full, the reader is requested to have an open Bible alongside and read the appropriate text before reading the comments here. Thank you. Exodus 21 verses 7 through 11 read. The context is female slavery, the sale of a daughter to be a wife. If her husband is not satisfied with her, he cannot sell her on the open market where she might be purchased by a foreigner, as Joseph was. But she could be redeemed, bought for a price, by a fellow countryman. 
or she could be passed on to a son to be his wife. But in this case, she must be given the full rights of a daughter. A third possibility is to keep her on and marry another woman as well. Moses did not bang bigamy. In this case, the first must still have her needs of food, clothing, and sex fully supplied. If not, she has the right to go free without any payment. It is this last point that has recently been picked up in a Christian treatise on divorce. The argument goes like this. If a slave wife could go free if her needs of food, clothes, and sex were not met, surely any wife today, including a Christian wife, could claim the same. If this is a sound deduction, then a number of valid exceptions have been added to the single one of Jesus. In a word, neglect can set one free from a marriage and for another. Deuteronomy 22, 13 through 30. This is not often referred to in debates on divorce, but we shall see in chapter 5 how relevant it is, though its primary reference is to the is to premarital pros promiscuity. In Israelite culture, a bridegroom expected his bride to be a virgin. He did not expect to pay for secondhand goods. The penalty for discovering he had been cheated in this way was very severe. She was stoned to death. But such rough justice needed to be protected from abuse. A false accusation could be used as an excuse for a quick escape from a regretted partnership. It was the duty of the bride's father to protect, protect his daughter's reputation and her life by reporting the situation to the civic authorities and producing evidence of her virginity, bloody bedsheets after a ruptured hymen. Punishment for the lying bridegroom was to pay substantial compensation to the bride's father and, ha and remain married to the girl as long as she lived. He could have divorced her simply because he disliked her. See Deuteronomy 24 in the next section. But now he never can. The next case dealt with is adultery, where a man has intercourse with another man's wife. When discovered, found, both must die and both must die. There can be no forgiveness by the innocent husband. Contrast John chapter 8 verse 3 and 4. The following situation gives a vital insight into Jewish culture. Note that a virgin pledged to be married is already a man's wife and sex with her constitutes adultery. Brothel nope. then was taken far more seriously. Betrothal, not oh, brothel. Brothel. I am so, why do I say that all the time? I don't time? know. Brothel. No. It's betrothal. Betrothal. <laughs> I'm so sorry. Okay, okay, let's start that again. I'm going to start that again. Betrothal. Betrothal then <laughs> was taken far more seriously than engagement is now. And a separation before the relationship had been consummated was a divorce. Cross-reference the situation of Joseph and Mary. And that is in Matthew chapter 1, verse 18 to 19. Such an adultery also demanded the death of both involved. Of course, it all depended on whether the premarital sex was consensual or forced. If it happened in the camp, cramped. in the cramped conditions of a town, and the woman had not cried for help, she would easily have been heard and quickly responded to. It was assumed that she had voluntarily cooperated. If it had happened out in the country where cries would not have been heard, she would be given the benefit of the doubt and assumed to have been forcibly raped. Had she not even been engaged to be married, the death penalty was not imposed on either. However, if they were discovered, they had to be married and the groom 
pay the bride's father an appropriate sum. The passage closes with one forbidden marriage of consanguinity. How do you say that word? Consanguinity. Yeah. Namely, a man and his father's wife, who may or may not have been his actual mother. See First Corinthians chapter five, verse one. The main points to note in all of this are the most premarital sex carries the death penalty, and if one of the parties is engaged, it constitutes adultery. Now read Deuteronomy chapter uh, 24, 1 through 4. Unlike the previous passage studied, this one is always brought up in debate. Primarily because it is the only direct mention of divorce and remarriage in the Mosaic body of legislation. It is important to notice what it does not say on the subject. It neither commands nor prohibits divorce. It simply accepts that men will divorce their wives and marry others. It does not mention the usual method of giving nope, her a certificate. Nope. What? It does mention. Oh, it does mention. Thank you, Nikki. It does You're mention welcome. the usual method of giving her a certificate. Whether this states the reason for it, we are not told. But with it, she has proof that she is free to marry again and sends her out of his residence. That is all that is required. Note that in the case cited, she does find a second husband who also dismisses her in similar fashion. All that is forbidden is a third marriage to her first husband. She cannot go back to him, but must find someone else. To go back to the original would be offensive to God and in some way pollute the whole country we can only speculate exactly how, but must take God's word for it. And that's all. It is quite astonishing that discussion of the application of this passage should focus as it has on the grounds for divorce. The attention is not on this issue and was probably not in Moses' mind at all. Nor is there any hint that Moses would have limited divorce to the reasons mentioned. The reason given for the first divorce has been highlighted. It's an obscure phrase, not easy to translate. It has a certain offensive tone, indecent, unclean, naked, and might refer to some blemish or even deformity only visible to her husband after the marriage. But nobody really knows, and it does not really matter. The one thing we can say for sure is that it does not refer to adultery, for which the only action that could be taken was death, not divorce. What makes the discussion superfluous is that her second divorce, equally accepted, was for no other reason than her husband's dislike of her. We have no idea why he didn't like her. <laughs> we could leave it there, but later Jewish scribes were not content to do so. As we shall see in chapter 4, they use this text in a way that was never intended to debate the legitimate grounds for divorce, even with Jesus himself. Christians have followed suit, especially those who believe these laws apply to the church as well as Israel, an assumption we must look at before we close this chapter. Meanwhile, we can summarize this section by stating that there were only one situation in which Moses banned remarriage after divorce to a former husband. Note that there is no mention of a wife divorcing her husband. The possibility was not considered. In closing, we need to raise two general issues. The first is the significance of such regulation of social practices. The second is how far regulations in the Old Covenant are binding on those in the new. Social evils, or simply practices with harmful effects, need to be controlled in any society, if only to restrict their influence, but legal provisions for their constraint in no way sanction their legitimacy. For example, the licensing 
licensing of, here's that word, brothels, brothels <laughs> or casinos in no way endorse the social benefits of prostitution or gambling. It is a way of controlling, even restricting such habits. It is a recognition that fallen human nature will want to do these things anyway, and it is the lesser evil to have some public control than none at all. This is an argument which has been advanced by some campaigners for abortion under professional rather than amateur backstreet hands. But all such like legislation runs the risk of thy naive assumption that if it's legal, it must be all right. Of necessity, such social legislation must involve moral compromise. But acceptance does not mean approval. Moses accepted such things as slavery and polygamy, which were part of the social fabric of his day, and therefore issued laws for their control, but in no way implied divine favor. This is particularly true of his treatment of divorce. We shall see that Jesus himself drew a distinction between God's intention and Moses' concession to human weakness. And you can find that in Mark chapter 10, verse 5. We must be careful to do the same. This brings us to the other question, the Christian use of Moses' laws. How binding are they on disciples of Jesus'? Opinion varies between total relevance to none at all, depending in turn on whether the relationship between Israel and the church is one of continu continuity or discontinuity. Behind that is the fundamental issue of how the Old Testament relates to the New. The very names of the two parts of our Bible contain a wrong answer, since testament and covenant are synonymous suggesting there are only two covenants in scripture. What, Nikki? Is that, I thought that was synonyms. Oh, that could be synonyms. I'm sorry. When I say synonymous? Yes. That's is that the same. same thing? I don't think so. Okay. Synonyms? Yeah. Okay. Suggesting there are only two covenants in scripture. There are at least five major ones. The Nohidic or Nohayic, Abrahamic, Mosaic, Davidic, and Masonic. All five are Messianic. mentioned in both Testaments. Only one is called Old, Mosaic, and has been replaced by the only one called New, the Masonic. This is why the Mosaic Covenant established at Mount Sinai is regarded in the New Testament as temporary, Galatians chapter 3, 17-25, and obsolete in Hebrews 8, 7 through 13. Logically, this means that the Mosaic legislation is also past its sell-by date, but Christians are not always logical. Most have taken the Ten Commandments very seriously indeed, including them in catechisms and communion services, inscribing them on church walls, yet they have paid scant attention to the 600 plus bylaws added by Moses. Few, if any, would advocate a return to the punishments he advocated. Over a dozen sins deserved capital punishment, including a son's rebellious attitude. Exact physical retribution, eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth, hand for hand, burn for burn, wound for wound, bruise for bruise, that's in Exodus 21:24, was demanded for serious injury. Even a woman's hand could be cut off if she had grabbed an opponent's genitals during a fight with her husband. No kidding. Isn't that crazy? Many requirements are totally ignored, from wearing clothes of unmixed material to 12 months honeymoon leave for soldiers. Bearing in mind that Moses demanded that everybody promise to keep all the laws all the time, it is amazing that anyone would undertake such a commitment, though the Israelites did. 
Exodus 19 verse 8. But the New Testament contains no such vows relating to Moses' laws. Indeed, Paul's militant objection to circumcising his Gentile converts was that it would obligate them to keep the whole law, Galatians 5.3. He argued that Christians were as dead to the law as Christ himself was after his crucifixion, Romans 7, 1 through 6, a passage we shall look at again. If there seems inconsistent, <clears throat> if not hypocritical, oh, how funny. I was trying to move my mouse and I wasn't even touching the mouse pad. Never mind. <laughs> it therefore seems is inconsistent, if not hypocritical, for Christians to use the law in selective manner, quoting some of its requirements, but not others. This is especially so when seeking to establish a biblical case for a viewpoint, for example, against homosexual activity. The most that can be established in that way is that God disapproved of it in Israel. But there is ample evidence for the wider application in the New Testament. And this is the test. Okay. Any Mosaic oh, legislation upheld by Jesus or the Apostles is still applicable. <laughs> I can't say that word. Appl say it applicable there we go it has be become part of the law of christ the law of moses concerning divorce is only relevant to a christian discussion insofar as it illuminates the jewish background against which the pharisees challenged jesus to reveal his stance christians are not under the that law chapter three what prophets said. Israel was a wife and God, Yahweh, was her husband. This was the basic insight underlying much of what the prophets said. They saw the covenant made with the fledgling nation at Sinai as analogs to a wedding with vows made on both sides. For a vivid metaphorical description of the relationship from the birth of the nation to her courtship, read Ezekiel 16, 1-14. Jews have seen the Song of Solomon as an allegory. Even Preston... An allegory. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Jews have seen the Song of Solomon as an analogy and even pressed it as an allegory <laughs> of their kinship with the Almighty. It gave God's spokesman a ready smile. Simile. Oh my gosh. It gave God's spokesman a ready simile when the very first of the Ten Commandments was broken and Israel went after other gods. She became an unfaithful wife, even a prostitute, above all an adulteress. See Ezekiel chapter 16 verses 15 through 34 for a sneering indictment. What would this do to the marriage, and what would the what would that mean for human marriages? We look at three of the prophets and their message. First, Hosea, chapters one through three. The prophets were often called to demonstrate the word of the Lord in their lives, as well as declare it with their lips. Jeremiah had to remain single, and would die young. Ezekiel would lose his wife, but must not mourn for her. Hosea had perhaps the hardest lot. He was to marry a woman of doubtful morals and reputation. He would become the father of three children, not all of whom would be his. Then she would leave and go back on the streets from which he had taken her, but he was not to leave her there, but to go and search for her, rescue her from her pimp, bring her back home again, discipline her, then resume conjugal relations. Having done all this, he would be in a position to share convincingly how God felt about his people. He was the last prophet to be sent to the ten northern tribes of Israel after they had broken away from Judah in the south and before they had, were invaded and deported by Assyria. He followed Amos with his message of justice and judgment. Significantly, 
Hosea's final appear, appeal for repentance focused on mercy. It was cri de cor or of unrequited love, chapter 11, 1, but it fell on deaf ears. However, in Hosea's own experience, there was clearly a hope of recovery. The hound of heaven would hunt his people again. The marriage could and would be restored. This suggests that, called to be holy as he is holy, God's people should also hold open the door to reconciliation when their partners are unfaithful. Read Jeremiah chapter 3, 1 through 10. At first sight, this prophet seems to take the very opposite line to Hosea. The ten tribes of Israel in the north have by now disappeared into captivity. And the Lord says he has given them a certificate of divorce and sent them away. This sounds like a final dissolution of any marriage between them. Believe it or not, Christians have used this to justify their own divorces. If God can do it, so can we. Before jumping to this conclusion, we need to look more carefully into the passage and its context. Attention is now focused on the remaining two tribes in the south, Judah and Benjamin. Together, they took the collective name of the larger, Judah, from which would come the word Jew. They had seen what happened to her sister Israel, banished for her adulterous behavior. Yet Judah was now just as bad, if not worse, just as unafraid of God's judgment and therefore facing the same fate divorce but the metaphor begins to break down when the context is examined it is not exactly parallel to the breakdown of a human marriage this passage opens with a reference to mo to the mosaic regulations in Deuteronomy chapter 24 we have already looked at pointing out that it would defile the land if a woman returned to her husband after having been with other men. Humanly speaking, it would have been very wrong for God to take either sister Israel or Judah back into a covenant relationship they had both betrayed. However, God is God. He could act above and beyond laws made for human behavior. He would have taken Israel back had she returned, i.e., responded to Hosea's verbal and visual appeal. God even says he thought she would, but she didn't. Verse 7, we won't discuss the implications of such a remark for his foreknowledge. The section following chapters 3, 11, and no, no, no. verse 11, no, chapter 3, verse 11, through chapter 4, verse 1, yes. gives ample proof which its repeated plea return that he hoped Judah would change her mind and repent before it was too late. But she was as stubborn and rebellious as her sister and was also sent away to Babylon. End of story? Or it would have been in any other divorce. The history of God's people Israel would have ended here, but it didn't. God is God and often does the unexpected. Before he finished his ministry, Jeremiah had promised that the land would bring them back, that, that the, the Lord would bring them back from exile. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. First, chapter 29, verse 11. God may have removed the Jews from their land, but he had never rejected them. Romans chapter 11, verse 1. They may break their marriage vows to him, but he will never break his to them. Leviticus chapter 26, verse 44. Jeremiah chapter 30, verse 11. Ezekiel chapter 16 verse 60 
and many other references. His certificate of divorce is temporary. His new covenant will be for Israel and Judah. Chapter 31, verse 31. Malachi, chapter 2, verses 13 through 16. By this time the children of Israel had returned from exile in Babylon, though by no means all of them. Having spent a lifetime there, many were unwilling to leave their social and commercial security to face the rigors of rebuilding a nation from its ruined capital, Jerusalem. Their leaders, Ezra and Nehemiah, were also concerned about a moral and spiritual recovery. Among other lapses from God's standards was an increase in mixed marriages with spouses from outside the chosen people exp expressly forbidden in Moses' Torah. Ezra confessed it with shame, see chapter 9 in his book, while Nehemiah dealt with it quite drastically, see chapter 13 in his book, pulling out the men's hair and demanding, they, demanding that the practice stop immediately but it had continued. Malachi was the last prophet sent by God until John the Baptist a few hundred years later. Far from recovering anything like the high spiritual state under King David, the nation was in serious decline. Slipshod's habits of be belief and behavior were eroding the national religion, morality, and general prosperity. The prophet confronted specific slackness in priests and people, from offering crippled and diseased animals for sacrifice to, fa to a failure to bring all the tithes. Among other changes, were too connected with marriage. Were too connected with marriage, as we already mentioned, mixed marriage with non-Jews was still happening. Malachi went much further than Nehemiah's scalping, scalping by calling down on the men divine excommunication from the chosen people. But another evil was now rearing its head, destroying family life. Divorce was rapidly increasing. The Lord had been present as a witness to the commitment young couples had made to each other. He calls this a covenant, like those he himself had made with Israel. Just as those who married Gentiles were breaking faith with his covenant. Uh, chapter 2, 10 through 11. Men divorcing the wives of their youth, clearly they had grown tired of them, were breaking faith with them. It was treachery, a betrayal. Significantly, he appeals beyond Moses to God's original intention and action in Genesis chapter 2, verse 24. As later, Jesus himself would do. Note that he adds that the two have been one in a spirit as well as in flesh. Sexual intercourse in humans is more than physical coupling. It is the spirit that needs guarding to avoid marriage breakup. I hate divorce, says the Lord. This is the last word on the subject in the Old Testament. It is a very strong statement and emotional as well as a rational expression of abhorrence. Such action is utterly contrary to a covenant-keeping God. This is immediately followed by his hatred of a man's violence, which may refer to the physical and mental abuse which can precede a divorce. It is also followed by another warning to guard one's spirit against breaking faith. Finally, notice that God is concerned about the children in such situations. They are less likely to be godly if their parents divorce. And there we have it. It's a lot of, a lot of stuff there. It's a lot to think about. Um, I, I'm, I'm hoping that those chapters and verses that you know we had read that people will go and read them for themselves not just accept you know his synopsis you know what i mean yes but to go in search it out for yourself i can't say this enough when it comes to the word of god 
I, I just can't say it enough. Read it for yourself. Search it out for yourself. We are fallible. God is infallible. And his word's going to stand. So, even though we're reading this book, it doesn't mean this book is infallible. He can make mistakes. He only knows what God has opened up to him. That doesn't mean that God's not going to open more up to you through his word. That's the key part. A lot of people want to go on, oh, but, you know, God said this or God told me that. You Line it up with the word. Line it up with the word. God is not going to go against his word. He's not going to do it. So if you're hearing words, if you're in an adulterous affair or a marriage or whatever, and God says, oh, no, you're all good, you're all good. And so you think, well, I'm all good. What, does the word say you're all good? Line it up with the word. Line your life up according to the word of God. And then you will know what God is saying to you. So many people these days is, Nikki, they are so focused on, well, I feel or I know God knows my heart. Oh, my gosh. That's or the worst. my God. No, 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 people. No, 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 no. It's what does the word of God say? And I, you know what? I'm not saying I'm a King James only person because actually I'll go by, back and forth with different uh, translations. But these modern translations, you may as well just throw them in the, in the garbage. And that's how I feel. I do not care. The NIV, throw it away. Burn it. Because that is not God's word. It is Satan's mutation. That's exactly what it is. It has taken verses out. It has added verses in. And it has changed words around. NIV is not of God. It's not. Now, as you know, and speaking of which, you know, a little side note, little little tidbit there. You know, when we were studying out whether and what the Bible, what it actually said about mm -hmm. a pre-trib and all that other stuff. Right. Because you know, you just you have to search these things out. You have to. And that to. was a fire topic to search out. And if you take the NIV and you take the KJV and you line those up and search those same verses to show what the stance really is you'll find that the KJV does not support it in any form or fashion it mm -hmm. tells you just no. like it is but oddly enough the NIV supports it and gives you it twisted well, the enough NIV to also it. has literal scriptures removed right and then it also has in Isaiah it calls Satan the morning star hmm. You know, or the day star. I'm sorry, it has Satan being the day star. And then Peter says, until the day star rises in your heart. Wait a minute. You want Satan in your heart? Absolutely. You see, it's all messed up. Go to the old paths. And I'm not saying, if you can't understand the KJV, get a new, what is it called? A new NKJV, a new one. Eh, you know. One of the first translations. No, Nikki, I'm not saying stick with the KJV. No, I will not, not say I'm that. I'm not saying that either. But you know I what? Do. There's the American Standard version, which is pretty good. And there's the, um, I believe they call it the ES. You just got to. EVT you, or something like that. The, the main thing is, is, you know what? Take them. Um, take it all to God. Yes, God absolutely. God has preserved absolutely. his word. For thousands and thousands of years, trust me, he's going to make sure. And you he are has preserved his and word. And if you are fervently seeking him, I'm not saying that, you know, he can't show you and some of these other translations mm -hmm. and stuff. Because you know what? The Lord can do what he needs to do. If you are, serve, if you are fervently seeking him. He'll make sure you get what he's trying to lay down. Yeah, I do believe that. But the I thing do believe is, that. But the thing is, is you got to seek him. You've got to be fervent. You've got to be sincere. You, you can't just go and, I mean, I like David Paulson. Don't get me wrong. You know, he has a way of presenting things in the synopsis. Uh -huh. I do. But to go back and to honestly read for yourself those things, that's something that must be done. It's got to be done. And the thing is, you've got to be so honest and you've got to be sincere. 
when you go before the Lord, you say, Lord, show me. I want to know the truth and I'm going to follow in it regardless mm -hmm. of what it is, whether it hurts me or not. I will obey what you say. Well, I mean, here's a prime example. We, we literally just showed this prime example. Just as we were reading, we'll take the word brothel and betrothal. Yeah. You know, just as we were reading, you know, you misread the word, but I was reading along with you. Exactly. I was literally reading for myself, and I was able to pick up on that. Just like when I miss up on a word, and you're able to point it out to me. Yes. Because what are we doing? We're reading it for ourselves. And I understand that some of you, you might not have the chance to get this book, and you are, you know listening for that reason to have it read to you and stuff and that's a, another reason why it's great to read books together exactly is yeah. because we're able to you know hey wait that's not how that was worded right exactly. you know and, and that's nice and that's great of course you know again we'll put the links to how to get this book and stuff mm -hmm. so if you do get a chance you know that's great but i think i'm looking forward to chapter three and the, i am too i am the too. next one I'm glad that we got right. through chapter two and three today, and I look Me forward too. to mm -hmm. the next time. All right. We love you all. Have Keep a good your night. eyes on Jesus. Keep your eyes on Jesus.